Welcome to the True Face Podcast. My name is Robbie Angle, and I'll be your guide as we have conversations about what we can learn from what's going on in our lives. Most of us get stuck in our relationships with God and others, and we end up wondering, is this really all there is to it? Here's a question. What if God isn't who you think he is, and neither are you? The grace-based relational discipleship resources at trueface.org help you answer that, to help you live into your true identity. And this conversation with Aaron will help you do that, whether you're watching this on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Remember to subscribe and share and join the growing tribe of Jesus followers at trueface.org or on the app Trueface Life app. So Erin Weideman is a new friend. I have become friends with her husband and he Brent has talked up Erin like so hard that I was like, all right, I gotta meet her, see if she's real, because you're impressive, Brent, but you're talking about Erin is super impressive. So Erin and I have been wanting to meet because it I've assumed that we're gonna be friends based on the way Brent has talked to her, and we have become new friends, and I'm so excited to have her on the podcast. She is the founder of Truth Becomes Her. Uh, they Bible Bells books. She's She has done all kinds of stuff. Uh, she's a cancer survivor. She is has award-winning author of the Ad Adventures of Rooney Crew series, which she'll talk about. She has... Um, all kinds of stuff. Aaron, y y Legacy Story Academy, Bible Bells. Welcome to the True Face Podcast and catch us up on all the stuff you're doing. Your drive achiever seems pretty high as a high drive, high achiever. You've been busy, Aaron. Welcome. Very busy. Thanks for having me. Um, I've been busier probably in this season uh, in my own house than I was when I was running and gunning, even over the last 10 years. Um, yeah, I started off in school. I taught full time. Uh, until about 2016, God called me out of the classroom to uh, write a series of books that I thought, I, I don't know where you're going to take this, Lord, but it seems like girls today don't know about the women of the Bible the way they do about all the Disney princesses, but maybe there's something we can do about that. So that's really how Bible Bells was born. Um, that set me on, and Brent, on a, a trajectory, a new trajectory for life. Um, it's just like a daring life adventure following him. Uh, built a company now we have 13 books and digital products and all kinds of things in that regard in the space for girls and um, discipleship which I'm so excited about uh, now being the mom of four girls um, Rooney's nine we have Isla who just turned three and Roxy who is two and Naomi who is one so <laughs> I am in the throes of motherhood with three little toddler bears at home and then also um, a preteen so God's been showing me a lot, I think, as I've peeled back from being so professionally forward facing, um, doing a lot of group coaching now for uh, people who know that God's put a powerful story inside them. And through Legacy Story Academy, that's how I spend most of my days. So I wrote a curriculum that helps people access what God's doing in their life and analyze that complex body of data that we all, you know, think back through our history and go, what in the Lord, what in the world were you doing, Lord? Um, and we distill it down and, and we put it into a, a message or a book or however God's calling them to share it. So all that to say, been busy, um, homeschooling. I am just trying to be a great wife and a mom. And yeah, God's just doing work on me in this season too, Robbie. I'm excited to be here though, for sure. Uh, you, when did you and Brent become aware of True Face? And when did you first read The Cure? I mean, just a few months ago, probably. Like he went to Young Guns, you guys connected there and... Um, yeah, I read the book. Well, I listened to the book on the chairlift when I would go up skiing um, at the mountain that's close to our house. And then yep. we also did, he and I did like a mini Bible study with the parenting resource too, which I, we found really valuable and we talk about all the time. The Cure in Parents is, uh, it, it, it was Life awesome. changing, man. Yeah, it's really, it was really, really helpful for us and continues to be for sure. It's so timely for that one too, with the preteen going from, because the cure in parents, like how to parent with grace is important in those early formative years of more directing parenting. But once that middle school preteen happens, like building trust and walking alongside as they mature and not and fighting the temptation to fix and direct the way that we did when they were five years old is a hard shift. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, and God is showing me that because I think when I get to the end of the day, I'm like, why am I so tired? And it's not because of anything physical I'm doing. It's because just the mental drain of like, how do I need to speak to you as a nine-year-old? And how do you need me to show up for you? And then be having all those little ones to care for and just be in the, the throes of like, it's less about, you know, guiding you and allowing you to make your own decisions. And it's more about like obedience and like the routine of the day and get to the end of the day. And I'm like, I really, it's, it's helping me to think through how to show up well for each of them in the current seasons mm. that they're in. Mm. When, when I was uh, going to have you on this podcast, I was like, okay, there's half a dozen things we could talk about. We could talk about like writing, capturing the story for, in all of us as you do through the coaching. We could talk about uh, like this, what girls need to learn about God and stories of in the Bible of who God made them to be specifically as females, with, which Bible Bells is brilliant in regards to helping girls understand their identity uh, and their their position as daughters as so much of the stuff is male driven and so neat. Yeah. They knew more about Disney characters than Bible characters breaks my heart. Uh, so like we could talk about all kinds of stuff, but then the more I heard about your story of the adventure of your life that you've been trusting God on. And I came into this a year over the past year with Brent as a friend, like we were, we were hanging out talking about it. We connected over adoption and y'all's roller coaster the past couple of years, we could talk about that. But as I heard more about your story, uh, I would love for you just to back it up and uh, talk about your journey of maturing, trusting God with these different truths, um, because you have a pretty, pretty unique story. So yeah, unpack that journey. Yeah. A little bit. I, you know, grew up in church and it was a I was a check the box kind of a Christian person. I think I would, I was very high achieving from a young age. I thought I can really feel valuable when I do well. And so, you know, going to church and memorizing scripture and, you know, I was, I was committed to doing, you know, school really well and getting good grades and doing well in sports and all of the ways that I could be, you know, high achieving in a worldly sense. Um, but I just decided at 16, based on what I was seeing in the Christian community, even though I was steeped in the culture of, church. I just felt like it wasn't for me. I was like, I don't, I don't really subscribe to this. I don't think I believe. And I would have called myself an atheist, like right out the gate as I'm making my way to the end of high school and starting college. And I spent the next 10 years just like believing that I had everything figured out. I was like, I'm highly conscientious. I'm responsible. I'm high achieving. I can just go out and do the things in the world that I want to do. And I got a full scholarship to play softball at Penn state, moved across the country away from my family made all the mistakes you would make if you're not walking with God and more. And then it was not until I graduated, sort of lost the foundation that I had built my life on, you know, things like academics and athletics and being really good at at that and just went kind of grasping for that next thing. And I took a job totally ill suited for my gifts and talents. I took a job in finance. I was always like enamored with stories and communication. And I like read the dictionary as a kid and never mind that like words are my life. I took a job working in finance and I was like, I can make a lot of money. If I can buy a house by the time I'm 25 as an unmarried woman, that's going to be like an impressive, that's like a next good step for me as somebody who's high achieving. And I remember like, you know, I, I I ground in that season, 60 hours a week. Like I worked so hard, made tons of money, bought that house and moved in, had a house house housewarming party. Two months later though, I moved out and back in with my parents. I was diagnosed with metastasized thyroid cancer that started in my thyroid gland and went to all the surrounding lymph nodes and tissue and into my brain stem. And it was so extensive. We did not catch it early. The prognosis was super grim. I remember sitting in the doctor's office, like the doctor didn't even do um, any testing, like no MRI, no ultrasound. He just like put his hands on my neck and determined, he was like, I just feel all of this. Like, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm pretty sure you have cancer. Like, I know, I know that's what it is. We should just do an emergency biopsy to be sure. And my mom was with me and I just remember being like, oh my gosh, like I, I'm, I'm in control of nothing. Like, and that set me on a path of lots of surgery, lots of treatment, five years of like recurrent disease just over and over and over. And it was not until I was, you know, I had just done my first surgery. I was still sort of in that cycle of like, man, I could do this on my own. I don't need anybody's help. Like I'm just, I'm functional. I can, I got it. 
And I remember being quarantined for three days uh, during a radiation treatment. I was in my parents' house and in, in their room and bathroom uh, doing this treatment. And I got so sick and dizzy, I laid down on the floor and I thought, nobody can come in here. They've told me to stay in here for three days. I'm so sick. If I faint though, like who's gonna help me? And I, I laid down on the floor and I put my face against the tile in the bathroom and I prayed and I didn't even believe. I just remember saying out loud, God, if you are real, I am sorry. I have made a mess of my life. I don't wanna die. I'm scared. No one can help me, but, but if you're real, I need you. And I just remember being hit with this overwhelming sense of peace. Like I was able to sit up and I just spent the next three days in that room wrestling with what I thought I believed, how I had spent my life um, running away and doing the things that I thought I was, I wanted to do. And after I got out of that quarantine, I really started to ask some of life's most important questions. Like, God, if you are real, what did you make me to do? Like, who am I? Uh, where should I be spending my time? Like, what's the best use of my time for the life that you want me to have? And God really ministered to me in that time. He wrenched my soul for children in a way I had never felt previously. And I thought, man, if I'm not going to live very long, I am going to spend the rest of my life just pouring into this next generation, helping them believe different, encourage them. You know, I'll choose a subject I'm passionate about, English, right? So I became an English teacher, um, got my first job teaching high school. And the rest is really history because that was it was in that time that God really began to show me what my personal gifts were and that, you know, writing and storytelling and engaging people um, with my own testimony was going to be part of those next and subsequent seasons of my life. So all that to say, like, I'm so grateful um, for how God used cancer in my story to just write my perspective and every I mean, now being years and years out of that season of life, like I had cancer over five year period, I had multiple recurrences, like it came back and back and back. I met my husband right in there, which was a weird time to start dating someone. Um, Cause it was just like an icky time, not, I didn't want to be vulnerable. It was just like, oh my gosh, get away from me. I'm just gonna plow through this. And he was like, no, I see this vision for our life and we're gonna get married. And I was like, you're crazy. Um, but I didn't know God was gonna radically heal me. I'm, I'm almost 12 years, fully cancer free, I mean, completely healed. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me, not because of God physically healing my body, which I'm supremely grateful for, but just because of what God did with my heart. And um, I just, I'm, I am so grateful to have a, a different and better opportunity to say yes to what he's gifted me with, to be on what we refer to in the Weidman household um, as a daring life adventure, um, following God wherever he leads us. And um, yeah, I gave my, my life to God shortly after um, that season. And yeah, it's been no regrets since, man. He showed us a lot of interesting things. We've, you know, I, I left a, an, an awesome teaching career to start a publishing company, start writing books about the women of the Bible and creating discipleship resources and sharing my testimony all over the world. And um, he just had me on a totally different trajectory than the one I had planned, and I'm just grateful to be a part of it, truly. Uh, and Brent started dating you in the middle of the grim cancer diagnosis. He did. <laughs> we met. We met um, at an alumni event. So we both went to Penn State, not at the same time. Brent grew up in, in he was born in Georgia, lived most of his life in Maryland. I grew up on the West Coast. I was an Orange County girl, born and raised went back east to school, and then we both had graduated and like plugged into the Alumni Association. So when we met, it was like, I had, you know, I'm, I'm at home living with my parents doing treatment. I thought with my extra time, I can't work. Let me just plug into somewhere where I can like make new friends and kind of give back. And they were doing some like community work. And I thought this is gonna be a cool place to hang out with some new friends. And he was there and we watched football every Saturday and we just kind of hit it off and I was like, Oh, no, 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 though. I'm like really in a bad place in life. Like, I'm probably not going to live very long. I remember saying that to him one evening when we were like on a date. And he just, he was like, I'm really not interested in any of that. Like, I'm going to be here to support you. And I just, God's given me this vision for my life. And I'm, and I've been looking for a wife and I know it's you. And it, he just, he like comfortably stalked me. I don't know how to explain it any other way. He just would not, he just would not take no for an answer, but in a very 
kind and respectful and forthright way he engaged me and his pursuit of me really showed me God's heart for people because that God just relentlessly pursues people and he loves us so in ways that just don't make sense and I remember you know like calling him up early in our relationship like a few months into dating and I just was like hey I have to have a surgery and he went and met my mom like in the waiting room with the surgery and he did puzzles with her and hung out and waited till I got out and it just became like part you know it's like part-time job that we had to deal with my health stuff and and we got married and you know didn't take a honeymoon trip instead we went to balmy rochester minnesota in the dead of winter to have surgery <laughs> like it was that over and over months and months and i really feel like god in that season was refining our relationship and showing us how to work through very serious challenges um, and struggles and how to just the way god weaved us together as a team and that season I'm so grateful for because now, I mean, even now, like with our four kids, we refer to us like it's it's a family, but it's a it's a team like we are a team. We everybody's got gifts that are to be used and leveraged for the kingdom, like being the co coaches of the team is like, how do we harness those? How do we identify them? How do we engage our kids? Like every time we've added a child, it's added a new dynamic or something that our family was deficient in and seeing it as a strength. Mm. And um just praying for like the ways that God wants us to engage the world and make an impact. Uh, but he's given us this unit of people. Um, and I, I'm grateful to be able to lean on. I think things I grew up learning as, you know, the member of a national champion sports team and, and going to college and playing like, you know, a- athletics at a higher level. Um, I think that gave me a good base for understanding teamwork and perseverance. Um, but I, I think, you know, meeting him and really the way that God weaved our family together um, through hardship and our, our marriage in that early season. Um, I'm grateful for those deeper levels of teamwork that I know now because I'm partnered with him. I, I, I love Brent as a new friend. Uh, and he, he adores you the way he talks about you and in the way that you do as well. I'm, I didn't know that y'all, that he started pursuing you and dating in the middle of cancer diagnosis and, uh, I love how you said he comfortably stalked you, but he represented how God relentl- relentlessly pursued us. So the, the same thing, one, one's more, one's nicer to God, but he's done that for me really well as a friend. He has, he has relentlessly pursued me as a friend, which is the, what God does for all of us of like just patiently, relentlessly, which I, yeah, when you say that, I appreciate that about how he is so uniquely made and loves me well as a friend, even the way, the way you're describing um, how he pursued you. I, I, wanna, I have a, a lot of questions I just wrote down. One of those is, uh, as an Orange County girl at 16, grew up in a Christian home who were checking the boxes, like Christian through and through, to walk away, unpack for me a little bit what was going on in because I think all of us have that angst for the next generation, you in particular for those next generation. And understanding what happened in your heart at 16 might help some of us in thinking about our own kids or adolescents we know. Yeah, I think, and I, you know, and I love my parents to death and I'm watching them like later in this season of their life really find God for the first time, which I'm so grateful for. But I think in that early season for me, like I just, it church felt like something and following God felt like something that we we did outside the home as like a part of being out socially. And it just, it wasn't part of who we were as people. So like there was no open Bible at home. Nobody was praying at home. Nobody was talking about Jesus at home. And like, did we have all the materials there? Yes. But like, because I didn't see my parents walking out their faith, I, they, because they didn't have one, um, it just felt like, okay, we leave the house, we go do these things. And then when we come home, we don't talk about any of that. We just kind of do what we want to do. And it was not guided by like a kingdom, like an eternal mindset in terms of like direction and casting a vision for where our family was going. And I think that paired with like, just what I saw inside the church community was like, just a lot of backstabbing and gossip and just unhealthy things that I saw as part of church and that are really inherent in like all human beings anyway. But I think seeing it in the church community, it just wasn't something I wanted to be a part of. And I thought, this is toxic, this is ugly. If this is what church is, if this is what Christians are, I don't want to, I want to disassociate. 
So for yeah. me, it wasn't like, mm, do I actually, like, what do I believe? It was less about what do I personally believe? Do I have a working knowledge of like who God is and why I am meant maybe to follow him? It was less about that. It was like, well, I don't see anybody um, in my life that's doing that well. Um, and the people closest to me aren't doing that well. They haven't chosen to live that way. So I just like, I'm just gonna go way over here. And it, and because I'm conscientious, because I'm responsible and high achieving and I, I aim for you know integrity and doing good things and all of that, like that's gonna be enough. And I'm just gonna take myself where I'd like to go um, and make all of the goals I set for myself you know, serving of myself, right? Like, what, what do I want? What are my goals? What, what do I want to achieve, achieve in life? And um, all of those things were worldly things. And I did very well. You know, I did very well in school. I did very well, you know, as, as somebody playing a sport in college. Um, I got out. I did well when I was a young adult, making lots of money. Like, it was that, you know? Um, but yes, it was empty. I was living 100 miles an hour, and God violently shoved me into reality with mm. a cancer diagnosis that forced me in the way that only he could to stop and redirect and um really transform me because he before he would send me anywhere um but i just remember being ministered to so powerfully even when brent and i met and were dating and um early in our you know early in our married in our married life we you know we joined a married people bible study and i remember going to like a 30s bible study inside someone's house and I was like, y'all study the Bible inside your house? Like, you don't, you don't just go outside and you don't just do your home. Like, people were at someone's, I was like, I never heard of like an in-home Bible study. <laughs> like, never. Yeah. And I went to this Bible study, you know, with my arms folded, like, what are these idiots going to teach me? And um, I'm like sitting around and they're all like, you know, it's men and women, 30-somethings, right? Like young professionals. And they are just having like a really healthy discourse about the Bible. And they're asking really smart questions and they're reading this book. And I'm like, I realized I had like a head knowledge and I had like memorized a lot of scripture and like knew some Bible characters and that, right? Because I had checked the boxes as a young person. But I remember sitting in that Bible study and like two things I felt like the Holy Spirit whispered, whispered to me, like right off the bat, I'm sitting there with my arms folded. And I felt, I felt in my soul that something was being said to me to this effect. You're the only judgmental person in this Bible study. And I went, okay, got it. <laughs> so that like kind of worked me over. I was like, all right, let me just sit with that. That feels icky. And then the second thing I felt was that I desperately, because I was smart, man. I was like, I have all this head knowledge. I want to debate these people, right? And tell them how wrong they are. And I realized I didn't have a working knowledge of who Jesus was. Hmm. I knew some facts about him. I had memorized as part of like confirmation and community classes and my catechism, like, like all that stuff. I had memorized some things growing up, but I didn't really know who Jesus was and what he said about himself. And I thought, I can't have the type of conversation I want to in here because I don't know what I'm talking about. So I need to go get smart and then come back and be able to add something productive to this conversation. And that was when, like when I went seeking, like when you're seeking, you find right yeah. like if you're going yeah. seeking with an open heart god's going to show up that's how he that's how he works so i'm i'm very grateful that he knocked me down several pigs inside that early season of like my baby christian you know the beginning of my real christian walk cuz at the beginning it was like yeah i can memorize all the stuff this is this is no big deal for me but it never meant anything to me and then as i grew it was like how do i make this my own am i wrong like, am I wrong about, do, do I even know why I believe what I believe? And I say I'm an atheist, but do, is that based on anything? Or is it just based on a bad experience I had growing up with no. other people? And it has nothing to do with God. So, I, like, for me, that's, that's how it all happened. It was interesting. And then I heard you in that earlier formative years of reengaging in your faith and trust in Jesus. You, you mentioned a couple of principles. One, uh, that for your family, that daring life adventure component, I want to tease out. But before that, you talked about how it, you really wrestled with who God made you to be, what he made you to do, those fundamental questions. And we were talking before we've recorded about how I'm processing, 
processing some of the stuff I'm learning from Jamie Winship, who was just on this about specific identity, how God made us to be. So based on your own story of doing that, of going, God, how have you made me? What does this look like in the middle of a cancer battle with the urgency of life? What have you learned or what do you hope I would know or any of us listening would know about the value or the importance of asking God that question of how have you made me? What have you made me to do? I think just like being willing to ask it at the beginning, I, it was like, I really had to graduate away from are all the decisions that I'm making so that I can achieve something for just myself. And I think that's, that's the biggest question is like, okay, God, if you made me and your heart is for, is for souls and people and you love all of the people you made like what's the best way for me to show up like with a with a working knowledge of my gifts and my wiring and how how you know you made me unlike any other person right and there's there's obviously certain characteristics we share um but like each individual person is a is a melding and a meshing of different skills and abilities and um I don't know, all kinds of things. I just really wrestled with God in that season to be like, well, number one, it gave me, it really gave me, I'm so grateful for this, like a very legitimate sense of urgency. Like the time that I have is less than I thought. And so how might life look different and better? Because right now it's, it's ill suited for me in the whole because like it's not aimed at, at the blessing or the impact for other people. So like right away I went, okay, if my, my goal is to serve myself and I know that I've wasted my time and those two things are linked together, like they're not mutually exclusive, right? So like I'm wasting my time by only living for myself. Let me, let me magnify or amp, like let me expand the amount of time or the impact that I have in less time if I now outwardly focus on other people and how I can impact their lives and make their lives better. So I thought for me, like, since I really struggled growing up with things like faith, um, identity, insecurity, comparison, like not understanding myself, like just feel like that, it just, you know, so many young people feel that way. I thought, where's the best place to insert myself? Not because I have it all figured out, but because like people need a, a particular kind of support and the bond that I can build with them because of my personality and like how I engage like people in conversation because I'm intelligent, like I can use all these things to like come at kids from a different angle and like just be with them and encourage them. And yes, like teach through a, you know, a subject that I'm really passionate about, but it was less about let's talk to them about writing paragraphs and essays and more about like, let's just get in the classroom with them, read through some literature, like, get excited about what we're learning about, but then I can like talk to them about their character and like, and, and just love on them. Um, and we all remember like that teacher growing up and that's what I wanted to be. I was like, let me get in the classroom. I don't know how much time I have. I don't have it all figured out. I'm gonna student teach at my alma mater down the street from my parents' house. Cause I literally like, like did my credentialing program as I'm sick at home with my parents. Like it was a, it was a season of like, wow, I really, I'm really humbled. I can't be out doing what I used to do I'm, I'm shifting, you know, I'm, I'm radically shifting my life to go in a completely different direction. And let me, let me just dive in, right. And apply my high achieving, like driven personality, like the things that I applied to like the worldly stuff for my own self. Let me just apply that toward the blessing of other people to make a good positive impact, not for myself, but for them. I love and that. I, yeah, I mean, things I learned in church growing up, I feel like shepherded me forward in that right um but i you know I, I talk to my daughter often about do we do we have to learn things the hard way because we god will teach us the hard way like we can you know do all the right things yeah. but if he needs to like he will teach us the hard way i'm very grateful though that like i had the support of the people around me like i would have said in that season too i think even just for people listening like if you're so bent on and i was certainly um, just doing it myself and having there be like a pride and an ego involved and like, I literally don't need your help. I don't need anyone's help. I'm going to do it by myself and then I'm going to get all the credit and it's going to feel really good yeah. if I didn't take any support or help and no one like helped to steer me along the way or help me keep my feet moving forward. Like I can do that myself. Um, 
but it's just empty when you're not sharing it with somebody. And I think that's the biggest thing that God's shown me is like, God wants to bring all these people together. And like, there's pockets of people doing exciting work and work that he wants to move forward. And it's like, you're not meant to be isolated in that. You're meant to like, see how does God want to make these kingdom connections and like gravitate toward each other and then bring all your gifts and creativity and then partner with him and then move forward and like go and get some stuff done. It's actually really fun to do. And I think, you know, at the beginning of our, my, even my writing journey where I'm at, I'm, I'm, I mean, what am I doing? I have a one-year-old baby. We've like had an idea for a book series. I have a you know baby at home. I am full-time teaching, grading papers on the weekend, kind of trying to write a book. It took me three years to write the first Bible Balls book because it was just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never written a book. Let me look at everything in the marketplace. How should this be different? It was just so many questions. I was so paralyzed by overanalyzing. Um, and then it wasn't until we got that second book done that Brent was like, you should quit your job. Like, I really feel like God is calling you to quit your job. Like, he's already in it. He set up the whole infrastructure of the business and he's making connections. He was like, Aaron, this needs you. You are like the grown up girl. You're the mom. You're the, you know, you're the insecure teenager that became an adult. Like, you've seen kids in the classroom. It needs a front facing person, the author of the book series. Like, it needs to be you. And I was like, I don't, I'm not going to go out and sell this yeah. book. I don't want to talk about my test, but it was just like, and God was like, no, it, it is you. And I quit my job in that season. We got like a violent sign from the Lord after praying one afternoon. Mm -hmm. And it was, I needed that. I needed him to be like, nope, it's this. And then shove me into the next season to go, okay, even though I committed my, the rest of my life to kids and like being in the classroom with them, you clearly have something else for us. You've shown us that that's what we're doing. We're going into something else that is unknown. We, we can say yes to it and just, we can own the progress, but God's gonna own the product, whatever it is. And I feel like that mindset has really sustained us as God has continued to level up. Like, are you, are you coming on this yeah. daring life adventure? And not just professionally, but personally too with the adoption. Like we doubled the number of kids we had overnight. It was just, we never expected to have any kids, zero. So it just yeah. was neat. It's been neat along the way to be like, nope, what do you have for us? Okay. And then now we, we stress less and just obey right away. Um, and I, it's, I, it's made all I, the difference for us. I, it doesn't mean it's easy, but man, it's like following him is a great, is a daring life adventure every day. Yeah. Uh, unpack a little bit more before I synthesize what I just heard, which was so rich about the urgency piece that came out of the years of struggling with cancer and the diagnosis, but the daring life adventure as you're heading into this new decade you got four girls what does that mean uh what, what do you hope it means and looks like in your heart and in your life in this chapter yeah i think um you know not getting complacent i think there are things that god wants us to prioritize i don't think i know uh that there are and we have gifts and we have time and we have talent and we have resources and he has he has given us no shortage of asset to steward and we are we plan to do that we talk with our kids about doing it um you know the things that are that break our hearts that intersect with God's heart for people that's what drives us forward and we do have limited time like your you know your your days are like only god knows the number of your days and the bible says teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom like like help me know every day that i don't know how much time i have um but i'm gonna wake up today and like god if you woke me up today there's something you want me to know and there's something you want me to do and so what are those things like what am i meant to know today and a lot of times for me, that's like washing myself in the truth of his word and what you like, what you guys do and talk about in true basis in terms of identity. Um, that's been my number one struggle my entire time. Uh, Cause I, what am I? I'm a high achieving. I'm a go, I'm a doer. I'm like, let's get things done. Highly efficient. Right. And you can fall into the trap of like legalism and doing all the things for God. Right. Um, on the other side of it, like, Am I okay with just what does God wants me to know today? Like he knows, he wants me to know I'm loved, that I'm his kid, that he sees me, that he's for me, that there's things he, he has planned ahead of time that I should walk in them, right? Good things that I'm supposed to be knowing and doing. So like if I can be there, uh, no matter where I'm at professionally um, or personally or in my marriage or with our kids or whatever, if I can just land on the fact that like 
he woke me up today, there's something he wants me to know and do, and let me just identify what those things are, do them to the best of my ability, God sees my heart. We're gonna get to the end and we give the account and you know, maybe we didn't get it all right. It wasn't perfect, obviously. Like we're gonna have blind spots all the way. We have a nature that we're wrestling with, uh, but we can aim for godly living and get excited about what God's showing us. I think it's been really cool. I don't know, for me, like just to, to say yes and obey and then allow the chips to fall where they may. That feel, feels really icky for somebody who's like, I wanna control everything, right? And like, I don't know, put all the pieces together and see how everything, you know, and like, feel like you're taking the steps forward to your own satisfaction, right? Um, but all that to say, like, I think we tend to overcomplicate it. I think God's, you know, God's a God of simple truths, right? He's laid a foundation. He's given us the truth. Like, we have all the information that we need. It's more about, like, are we saying yes to it? Are we actually believing it? And then we're going to allow that to inform how we think and feel and behave and act out in the world. Amen. Let it be so. I I don't think my role my role of processing and reflecting back, which is a role I made up for myself as I'm trying to do for my own life in conversations like this. Mm-hmm. Hope I think AI will replace me in in doing that pretty quickly because we could <laughs> upload that transcript and say, "What man? That is, you know, the principles of that." Uh, here's my AI. Um, competitor response to this that I just wrote down, which AI might do better. Uh, I heard that the cancer diagnosis led to an urgency, which taught you this principle that you had been serving yourself, which looked like control and comfort, but it was empty and it was a waste of your time. That, that was the insight that you got, that serving yourself was a waste of time so that the flip side of that, the mirrored response must be that serving others is how you maximize your time. So that's principle one. Principle two is then, okay, how do you maximize your time? Well, you can't, ma- what you did is then say, God, how have you made me to be? What have you made me to do? What are my personal gifts? Uh, you just said, what breaks my heart and how does that intersect with others? And for you, that was uh, truths, teaching, gifts God's given you for next generation and younger girls in particular. And so that's the second principle that if, if, we're, if our life is going to be about serving others and maximizing that time, how we maximize that time is ask the question, God, what do you want me to know and do? What, are you, what breaks my heart for the sake of others and who have you made me specifically? then you living into your specific identity as a passionate thought leader, teacher for next generation, that leads you to the life adventure of saying yes and obeying and letting the chips fall as they may. And that daring life adventure has looked adventurous, which does not mean comfortable or lazy or not driven but you mentioned subtly in there how it just feels more freeing and light, which is amazing. So Aaron just popped off. So Uh Zoom, thank you. As we were wrapping up, Aaron, this was amazing and this was a blessing. And uh, I I am processing these principles and thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing them with us. So check out Aaron at Bible Bells, Truth Becomes Her, Legacy Story Academy. We will put all that in the show notes. And thank you for listening to this True Face podcast. See ya.